The National Archives is the official archive of the UK government. Inside the repositories are mile upon mile of preserved documents. From the Doomsday Book to the Dark Archive, the documents held reveal stories and events from the past 1,000 years of British history. Over 900 years ago, William of Normandy landed in the south of England in pursuit of the English throne. On the 14th of October, 1066, the English and Norman armies clashed in battle just outside Hastings. Harold Godbrinson, the King of England, died. William of Normandy was crowned King of England on Christmas Day, 1066. After his victory, William had taken all the land and divided it amongst his Norman friends. Yet by 1085, many Normans had begun to disagree amongst themselves over the land they had been given. As a result, William commissioned the Doomsday Book to find out about his new kingdom and settle these disputes. Six questions were asked, such as how many men lived in each place, or how many animals there were. Often, people would lie about the amount of livestock they owned to avoid paying extra tax. The results of these questions were written into the Doomsday Book. William now knew about all the land in his new kingdom. The archives hold records of the reign of Henry VIII and the English Reformation. Henry broke with Rome due to his desire for a male heir, as his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, was no longer able to have children. Henry became infatuated with Anne Boleyn, and by 1533, Anne was pregnant. The Pope was not willing to grant Henry an annulment for his marriage to Catherine, so he could marry Anne meaning that Henry was left no choice but to break with Rome and set up a new church to ensure a smooth succession. A key moment in the Reformation was the dissolution of the monasteries, which was overseen by Thomas Cromwell, Henry's chief minister. Cromwell commissioned a survey called Valor Ecclesiasticus, which valued all church property and showed Henry how the crown's finances would benefit from the dissolution. This was followed by a visitation which looked for corruption within the monasteries. Evidence from the visitation and valour ensured their dissolution from 1536 to 1540. This exacerbated poverty as the monasteries provided the poor with arms and education and were a hub for saint worship and pilgrimages. From 1536 to 1540, over 800 monasteries had been dissolved and by 1547, £1 £1.3 million pounds had been raised for the crown leaving the economy, Henry's finances, the succession and the religious practice of the realm drastically altered. The English Civil War began in 1642, following years of dispute between King Charles I and Parliament. For the next seven years, following many bloody battles, the King was put on trial for treason on behalf of the people of England. Although at his trial he refused to recognise those that had tried him as legitimate judges in the court of law, he was executed on the 30th of January 1649, marking the end of the monarchy's God-given right to rule and the overthrow of the belief of the divine right of kings. One night, in Pudding Lane, the baker Thomas Farriner left his oven on. Such a simple error had such huge repercussions. Within the space of four days, 13,200 houses had burnt down, leaving 100,000 people homeless. King Charles II recognised the importance of preventing a fire this devastating in the future, and issued Holler to construct a map showing the extent of the damage in 1667. 
As well as this, Charles issued the 1667 Rebuilding Act to reconstruct London. This included the commissioning of Christopher Wren to rebuild St Paul's Cathedral. William Blake's Jerusalem exemplifies the sense of loss felt at the disappearance of England's pleasant pastures. However, with this loss came increasing industrialisation, precipitated by James Watts's steam engine, which led to England becoming the workshop of the world. Cottons produced in Manchester, ribbons in Coventry, wool in Leeds, Bradford and Halifax, soap and glass in St Helens, steel in Sheffield and metal goods in Birmingham were all manufactured to the highest quality of European craftsmanship. The smoke that filled the air brought a nascent British economic dominance, and a rash of inventors and designers created new ways to spend money. Circular revolving bookshelves, domestic cleaning products, confectionery such as chewing gum and chocolates, and places of leisure including skating palaces and menageries. This was an age of innovation. The transatlantic slave trade was a vicious cycle of oppression. The British set sail and stopped at West Africa, where they enslaved around 10 million people altogether, from the 16th century to 1807. Resistance and rebellions were present from 17th century to 1838. From everyday refusals of duties to armed revolts, the enslaved people tried to find ways to decrease the efficiency. In Jamaica, runaway slaves set up a community on a mountain surrounded by forests. They were called the Maroons and were extremely successful fighting British troops using guerrilla warfare. Consequently, in 1795, Britain gave an area of land to the Maroons where they could live freely. Law and order was a major issue in Victorian Britain and there were huge anxieties about rising crime. With industrialisation, more goods were being made and transported, banks where huge amounts of money were kept and the homes of those who profited on industry provided new targets for burglars. In large cities where huge workforces were employed, employment was very uncertain. The answer to rising crime was to reform the police and build new prisons. Between 1842 and 1877, 90 prisons were built or added to. Public opinion was that criminals couldn't change and that the purpose of prisons was to break convicts' will by being kept in total silence and by long, pointless, hard labour. The compulsory silence was believed to lead to moral regeneration and there were quite a few suicides. Prisoners spent eight hours on the treadmill a day or had to turn the crank a set number of times to earn their food. The treadmill was sometimes used to power machines, but the crank simply turned the paddles in a box of sand. There was no distinction between the ages of criminals, and over 1,500 children were held in the same prisons as adults, and there were records of 12-year-olds being hanged. The formatory schools were set up for offenders under 16, but sentences normally still began with a brief spell in an adult prison. From the late 18th century, radicalism and popular protests started to sweep across Britain. The Home Office began to chart these acts of resistance. Found files in the National Archives recounts mass protests such as the Chartist marches. Chartism was a working class movement prominent in the 1840s and 50s, striving for political rights and influences for workers. Protests like those in Watergate and Kennington were met with military force. In response, more radical leaders emerged. William Cuffey, the six-year-old mixed-race leader of the Dean Street locality, was one. He was arrested after instructing his groups to steal guns, buy gunpowder, and even ordered his group's wives to throw toxic ginger beer bottles filled with turpentine at police from their windows. Transcripts from his 1847 trial show he was sentenced to transportation for 24 years. 
Shortly after this judgment, he was shipped off to Tasmania to serve his time. Despite this being shortened to three years, Cuffey remained in Tasmania and continued his political activism, leading protests for democratic rights for Tasmanians. Despite being the son of a slave and a criminal, he was so influential that when he died in poverty in 1870, aged 82, obituaries were published in seven different Australian states. He was widely forgotten in the UK, but the impact of his campaigns for political rights are still relevant today in England and in Australia. Suval Evans, a wireless operator on the ship California, sends a wireless signal out to the ships in the area, warning them about the ice. Titanic was one of these ships. The Californian is soon surrounded by ice and it stops its engines. Titanic's lights are spotted on the horizon. According to some accounts, Cyril Evans sends another ice warning to Titanic. Jack Phillips' wireless operator responds crossly, shut up, shut up. Jack was trying to clear a backlog of messengers and was annoyed by the interruption. He was too busy and dismissed the message. Evan, satisfied that he has done his best to warn the other ships, turns off the wireless and goes to bed. At 11.40am on the 15th of April, Titanic strikes an iceberg. She sends out an emergency flares which are misunderstood and dismissed by the Californian crew. Jack Phillip works endlessly to send out distress telegrams in the hope of rescue. He comes too late, the unsinkable Titanic sinks. Over 1,000 men, women and children lost their lives. Fake news is all over history. Even the trigger point for one of the most monumental events of all time is debated among historians. Do you think a sandwich caused the First World War? On Saturday the 28th of July, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife were shot by nationalist gunman Gavrio Princip. Gavrio allegedly stopped to get a sandwich moments before the Archduke arrived, coincidentally at the exact same spot. No sandwich, no shooting, no shooting, no war. The political and diplomatic manoeuvring in the aftermath of the assassination led to the July crisis. A series of back and forth between major powers of Europe caused tensions to build. No one could come to an agreement. And ultimately, this led to the outbreak of the First World War. The Ministry of Information was formed on the 4th of September 1939 to organise war press and censorship. By 1942, the Ministry was spending £4 million per year on propaganda, including £120,000 commissioning artists for campaigns such as Careless Talk Cost Lives, aimed at soldiers. On the home front, other campaigns encouraged civilians to save home waste, evacuate children and grow their own produce. Artists weren't exempt from military service and so often did both during the war. Propaganda was a huge tool used to lead the Allied forces to victory in 1945. War ministry documents were classified, top secret. Loose lips could sink ships or break the cover of spies, like Noor Khan. Noor Inyak Khan was born in 1914 to a French mother and Indian father and lived in Paris until France was occupied by the Nazis in 1940. After escaping to England, she joined the Special Operations Executive. Throughout her training with them, she received praise for her reliability, work ethic and keenness, 
amongst doubters who declared her unstable and not suited to work in the field. Kahn was flown back to France in 1942 to be the radio operator for the French resistance movement, a dangerous mission to relay important information to Britain while moving all over Paris and evading capture by the Germans. After four months of resistance, Kahn was betrayed to the Germans and arrested by the Gestapo, disappearing from British reports. It wasn't until 1946 that an investigation started into Kahn's disappearance. A letter arrived from a French woman called Yolande Lagrave, who spoke of a fellow prisoner at Forsheim prison. At Forsheim, where I lived in a cell, I was able to correspond with an English lady who was interned there and who was very unhappy. Hands and feet chained, she was never allowed out, and I could hear the blows she received. She left Forsheim in September 1944, but before she left, she was able to let me know, not her name, that was too risky, but her pseudonym, and this by means of her mess tin. German members of the Gestapo were interrogated after the war. One said that Khan, After her capture, she showed great courage and we got no information out of her. These documents helped to track Noor Khan's movements during the war, from her work post and arrest in Paris, where she escaped and was recaptured, to her movement to Forsheim for safe custody, to her abrupt transfer to Dachau concentration camp, here, along with three other agents, Khan was marched to the crematorium at dawn and executed. She was recommended that in recognition of her outstanding courage, she be awarded posthumously the George Cross. Files on Noor Khan and many others were not released to the public until 2003, and many records like these have still not been released so there may be countless unseen heroes in the archives files. The Second World War was over, time to rebuild. But how? Britain faced labour shortages, so they turned to their empire for help. Operation Windrush was a go. The ship started its journey in the Caribbean, picking up passengers, many of whom had fought for the British armed forces. 492 people, including two stowaways, braved the vast Atlantic Ocean to reach Britain. there was a feeling of excitement. Some had family waiting for them at the dock. Others, like Sam King, who served in the British Air Force, were shocked by the greyness, cold and hostility of Britain at the time. Many were forced to live in underground shelters at first because of lack of housing. They faced discrimination, but the Windrush generation managed to achieve great things. Sam King became the first black mayor of Southwark and set up the biggest street festival in Europe, Notting Hill Carnival. In 1985, the fear of contracting the unknown and terrifying AIDS gripped the UK. This global sense of panic manifested itself in prejudice and homophobia, precipitated by lack of knowledge, early misconceptions about transmission, and the absence of effective treatment. The term gay plague became accepted media shorthand. But how would the government manage this terrifying crisis that had the potential to infect 20,000 people within just a few months? Their response to launch the biggest public health campaign to have ever existed with nationwide television broadcasts and leaflets to be sent to every home. The campaign was headed by Health Secretary Norman Fowler, who saw the only option was public education, given the nature of the disease. He attempted to challenge the hysterical reporting by taking an evidence-based approach and push the message AIDS could affect any sexually active person. Yet the explicit nature of the campaign had its opponents. Indeed, Thatcher was sceptical of the impression and sort of education the campaign would give, stating her dislike for the section on risky sex, believing it would do immense harm to young teenagers exposed to it. 
Yet despite its controversy, Fowler's Don't Die of Ignorance campaign largely reduced the number of cases in the UK while debunking the myth surrounding homosexual couples. Although it is still debated that his terrifying campaign did put a generation off sex for a while. In recent years, there has been a big change in how documents are created and stored. This has led to the formation of the Dark Archive. Here, storage space isn't measured in shelves and miles. In the Dark Archive, it's measured in zeros and ones. This is a digital repository created to store government files that are born digital. To protect against file deletion or corruption, three copies of each file are stored. This archive is growing fast, filling up with new types of documents like tweets from 10 Downing Street. Who knows how historical research will change? Maybe, instead of analysing handwritten notes, we will be interpreting the meaning of an emoji in government emails. The documents preserved at the National Archives help tell the history of the British Isles and its inhabitants. The stories that they tell help to educate, inspire and broaden our understanding of the past. These documents belong to the nation and they are here for everyone to access and interpret. What will you discover? <laughs>